very warm welcome to everyone this evening, those who are joining from uh, Bombay, outside Bombay, from the UK. We're delighted that you have had the time to come and attend this lecture, which I promise you is going to be rather interesting for most of us who study art history and who are used to going to the museum to see our wonderful miniatures. You have a feast ahead of you, and I can begin by welcoming both Himanshi Singh from Jaipur Rugs and Ben Evans, who I met a few hours ago. And was, he said, shall I cut down some of the slides? I said, no. And the word that I used is, we're hogs at the Museum Society. Show us all these wonderful carpet images that you have collected over the years from various museums around the world. So welcome both of you, Himanshi and Ben. And I do regret that Yogesh, who was supposed to give us this lecture along with Ben, has taken ill quite suddenly a few hours ago. So I greatly appreciate uh, Himanshi stepping in for Yogesh and we all wish him a speedy recovery. So on behalf of the chairman of the CSMDS, the trustees, on behalf of the Museum Society, all our members and all our guests this evening, a very, very warm welcome to Himanshi and Ben. A few words about Ben. Ben is a leading editor in chief and managing director of the London-based Halley Publication Limited. And he'll tell you what Halley is about during his talk which publishes the world's leading publication on antique and contemporary design carpets. Halley and its sister organization, Cover Magazine, are both under Ben's stewardship. Halley, of course, was published way back in 1978, and Ben launched Cover in 2005. He also produces catalogs for fairs, specialist rugs and textiles. And over and above that, he takes textile tours to Morocco, India, Japan, the Caucasus, and many other European destinations. They produce prolifically on this subject of carpets, sometimes four to six publications a year. A little bit about Yogesh and Jaipur rugs. It's a family-run business from Jaipur, which works with over 40,000 artisans in India in over 600 villages and sales to over 60 countries around the globe. Jaipur Rugs has been able to bring a huge positive change in the life of tens of thousands of these artisans, over 85% of them being women who work from their homes. Jaipur Rugs has won over a hundred national and international awards for design and on the social impact that they make and on the scale on which they make it. Yogesh was named one of the most influential people by Indian Luxury, the Lux Book magazine in 2020. I'm really sorry he is not here, but he has sent a very good PPP, which we're looking forward for Himanshi to present to us today. There's a special appeal for rugs, one of the most luxurious and finely made carpets and textiles was initially driven by the Mughal court. And I will let Ben lead us into this, ex this expose. Hundreds and hundreds of carpets have been woven throughout the centuries for European and Asian elites, and more so in the 19th and 20th century. I'm not going to stand between you and the talk this evening. The last time we had a talk on this topic was many, many years ago by Danny Mera. And welcome, Danny. I'm glad to see you're in the audience today. And we hope that you too will give us a talk sometime next year on your tribal carpets. 
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, technical team. What would we do without you young people? You've sustained us in Zoom for the last 20 months. And Jason John, who leads them, thank you so much for giving them the training and bringing them to our society. So thank you, Aishwarya. Thank you, Mrilandani. Thank you, Sanjana. And thank you, Yashraj. So on behalf of all of us, a welcome to our two speakers. And I look forward to welcoming Anita Rane Kothari, who will be in front of you at the end of the talk to do the Q&A and end with the vote of thanks. Enjoy the evening, relax, and dream of these beautiful carpets. It's really art underfoot, as the title says. The history of connoisseurship and the birth of these heirlooms. Manchahas, thank you. Tech team, I hand the speakers over to you. Thank you so much, Firoza, for the uh, for quite a nice introduction. And I'm uh, really sorry that Yogesh would not join today, uh, you guys, this evening. But however, we have made the best PPT, and then you know we we are looking forward for an engaging session today. So let me introduce you very quickly. You know, as uh, Firoza ji said, said that uh, Jaipur Rugs work with the network of around forty thousand artisans, and we are connecting these forty thousand artisans to the global market by selling by providing them market linkage into 60 plus countries. And now very, very recently, we have opened six retail stores in India. And just this September, we have opened up our stores um, in Milan and, uh, you know, uh, addressing this Milan Design Week. So whenever you are on your next design trip, do, uh, you know, visit to our stores. So then I'll quickly, uh, you know, share my presentation and explain uh, about, you know, some of the initiatives that Jaipur Rugs is taking up. Yes. So I'll very, very quickly explain you about that. You know how generally when Jaipur Rugs work at the doorstep of the, uh, you know, doorstep of the artisans in 600 villages across five states in India, this is usually a typical rug production looks like. Though our rugs are the hand knotted again. And when I say hand knotted, the technique is the Persian knotted rugs. So we have trained and skill trained all those artisans into the Persian knotted rugs where um, on your left hand side where you're seeing that you know a pattern in, in a very very vibrant color this looks like a design map right so what happens is uh, we make a design map and then according to that the certain color and you know the priority of the order everything being packed in one bill of material and that get dropped at the artisan's doorstep. And then over the months of time, artisans start making onto the product. And if you see a, a finished rug made out of the map, this is something looks like that, right? Wherein the artisan, depending on the construction and the quality of a carpet, uh, takes somewhere about two to eight months. And, uh, you know, that's how one finished rug made out of a typical map looks like. Now I'll just very quickly move on to, you know, what is Manchaha? And as the name suggests that Manchaha itself says made from heart. But this uh, just didn't suddenly pop up, you know, to Jaipur Rags that, okay, now that we are starting uh, to make Manchahas, we did an experiment five years back uh, with this rug called Anthar Rug. And, uh, you know, I'm going to narrate a very small story of, uh, of an innovation which sort of, you know, pushed us towards this unique uh, Manchahas. So if you, uh, you know, we made three different artisans and uh, what happened in this case is if you see the lower panel of this rug over here, it's all in three different designs. So the three were eventually fighting that whose design is going to take over the rug. You know, and as I said that the rug takes about two to three months to get made. If you see the topmost of the rug, you sort of find the harmony in the design. And that's how we named this rug as Anthar because where differences turn into, you know, turn into the harmony. And this sort of an innovation really pushed our boundaries to think that there is much more that these artisans are capable of doing, you know, and that's how our initiation of Manchaharak started, where weavers get to be the designers of their own rug, 
each rug is a part uh, you know of a unique artistry that's just one of a kind and they are not provided with any design map to sort of make those designs you know now this is as simple as uh, you know we have given a blank paper and we are asked to draw any anything over it right so for them their empty looms are actually the canvas for them to make something of their own so just to define manshaha in one word it's just a one of a kind innovation which is a part of our sustainable initiative where each artisan weaves the design on their own which is the reflection of their own unique individuality and you know the unique part about manshahas is that they cannot be replicated into the exact same design and color because uh, you know just a quick fact check when we initially started manshahas we dropped the you know drop the bill of material without any maps and you know just with the color balls and just with the color yarn and for good 10 15 days these people didn't open up the check our artisans didn't open up the bill of material they were too scared that you know what they are going to make into the rugs and what they are going to make into uh, you know make them whether it will sell what will happen with it how, what if i do the mistakes and you know and then suddenly slowly their workshops and everything started getting bind up however right now as we are standing today these beautiful artisans have won over 11 global awards you know uh, in in competition with the major design houses and major uh, uh, the ma major global design houses wherein most of these designers are either very base have a basic education or completely uneducated now here uh, you know as you just think about you know any any art piece that you own right why it is very different uh, and why it is very unique to the artist who is making it it's as simple as because that you know it's 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 very individual to them and that's what the manjahas are these are exactly the reflection of what they see in their surroundings or what they think of and the great part about manjahas is that they emerge on every single day as you know as a persian knotted rug takes about 2 months 3 months or sometimes 8 months depending on the quality the manjahas emerges every single day so it provides us the uniqueness and it provides one of a kind you know tapestries and artwork to us but what it provides to the artisan is their identity their dignity you know with this particular thing we actually uh, you know let's say innovate the whole new trend into the villages where now they say that you know we no more want to do the normal production orders give us the manjahas we want to make our own manjahas right and then you know just to narrate it i'll go uh, i'll take you through a very very normal story which is you know just uh, this carpet is a outcome of a fight between a husband and a wife and i think we all are pretty much aware about the fights in a relationship so what happens in this one is you know these are our two we were designers bakchand and parvati and sort of if you see the lower panel of this design this has been done by bakchand so bakchand was a professional weaver and he sort of taught his wife to how to weave a rug and if you see this small patches coming up over here is a different pattern which is leheria so his wife was weaving this pattern he eventually scolded and said that you know look at my pattern it's more symmetrical and you know more geometry and it's more in sync what you are making is uh, you know it's not that well and she said i'm not going to follow your design and then what they have done they called some of the village people and asked them that you know whose design is going better and the village people said that you know what you are making we have sort of seen in many different designs but what she is making is completely different and then from this point onwards he says that you know now i recognize that my my, my wife is a master and they both together woven this entire rug into this sort of abstract design which is also called leheria and leheria is a very famous pattern in rajasthan and they named this rug as savan ka leheria which has been awarded european product design award in 2019 but the very unique uh, you know what make these pieces as unique and we uh, you know when we have seen multiple such pieces coming out from these weaver designers we really thought that you know in a coming time they are going to be the collectibles and just very recently we have showcased uh, three of our artisans work into this contemporary art gallery in delhi nature mode and these manshahas has over the time evolved their design language evolved the colors being used in it and evolved sort of the you know the way 
usually we look at the carpets and evolve the way we usually look at the weavers. They are no more just the weavers. They are now turning out to be the designers who are actually being able to narrate the story onto the rugs and you know stories that actually make the impact. And at the same time, they are being able to recognize the colors, the patterns into the rug, what's going to suit best, what's not going to suit best. And at the same time, to you know, to not to forget, there is no drawings or no design maps being given to these artisans for the sake. Now, just to uh, you know, where uh, we are very very proud also to say that these manchahas has let us mark the most of the design awards you know across the globe, be it the El Deco International Award or the German Design Awards, and these artisans were actually their rugs are being represented against the most you know influential designers and most well-renowned designers as well. Moving to the next, you know, these are some of the patterns that's been emerging over. We started Manjaha sort of back in 2015. And that's how over the time their language is also evolving into the design where you can see the geometrical pattern being emerged. But each and every rug that you are seeing is has a different story to narrate to it. And a unique perspective to this is not a single design can be uh, you know, can be replicated exactly. Because the when the artisan make these rugs, they use multiple of colors. So when I say multiple of colors, there is no set pattern or no set color palette given to the manchahas. And most of the time it also happens that they travel around the village and pick up the yarns from their friends and the, you know, and the fellow weavers as well, where they just say that, you know, maybe I like this, I want this color to put in my manchaha but you know, I do not have it in my bill of material. So they go around the village, pick the colors and sometimes do barter as well for the colors as well. But this is what, you know, evolving the design language in the, in the rugs as well. And when these manchahas are being showcased, you know, either to the consumers or to the design connoisseurs, they sort of speak a very different language. And they sort of, you know, when I say the different language, they sort of tell the uniqueness and the tell the unique stories of each artisan into the rugs. And then this Manchaha Initiatives has, you know, uh, let us, or I would rather say that, you know, has imbibed us to start this initiative into the central prisons of Rajasthan, where the Manchaha into the rural villages give the dignity to the artisans, sort of reinvent the entire, uh, you know, sort of reinvent the entire carpet industry. But at the same time, in the central prisons, it led us to more, you know, uh, more creativity, more healing. And I think, uh, you know, most of us, or if not most of us, we are aware that, you know, uh, the art of Persian knotting has been introduced to us by Mughals, as, uh, as rightly said by Feroza Ji. And, you know, these are, it's an old tradition of making the rugs into, into the jails. But what sort of we have done is we have given the free hand to these inmates. So basically all the long-term, uh, you know, all the long-term sentence inmates make these designs. And it is absolutely delight to see that what they are putting in each rug is, you know, what they really want to do outside or what they really want to do once they are out of these, uh, once they are out of these jails. But at the same time, this initiative is also providing them opportunity to earn for their family when where they are serving the sentence into the prison their accounts are being opened up so whatever the work they do into the prison that amount of work uh, you, that amount is being sent to their bank accounts which then can be used by their families as well i'm going to show you a very small video of what this initiative is initiative is all about and then i'll take you towards the end of the slide just allow me a minute मेरे को तकरीबन पौने छह साल की करीब जेल के अंदर हो गए जेल जेल खाना में तो वक्त गुजारना काफी मुश्किल काम है 
दिमाग तो थोड़ा ऐसा ही रहता है यहाँ तो अफसर रहता तो जेल खाने में कि बच्चे बाहर हैं काफी दिक्कत है थोड़ी गुस्सा आता था क्रोध आता था जैसे गलीचे में काम करने लग गए तो सब उनको बोल गए धीरे धीरे छूटेंगे जैसे छूटेंगे जेल के अंदर आ गए अब तो अपने सुख शांति काम संभालो अच्छी बात अपने मन चाहे जो बनाते हैं उसके अंदर मतलब दिल खोल के बना सकते हैं कि अपन को क्या चीज बनाती है वो किसी का दबाव नहीं होता बिना दबाव में अपने जो दिमाग में आता है वही चीज जो अच्छी लगती है वही बनाते हैं कर रहे हैं हम जेल में भी कुछ काम कर रहे हैं एक दिन सबको ही जाना है बाहर तो यस कमिंग बैक to the presentation so this is where you know we have sort of revived the old tradition where uh, you know it's like a one is our extension to the manchaha initiative and second we have sort of revived the mughal tradition of weaving into the jails but we have sort of given it a more humanitarian spin where uh, we have asked them to you know use a free hand to make any and everything that they want to weave in a rug and i'll just share a very small uh, you know two stories which emerged from one of our uh, one of our uh, manjaha rugs from the prison this is the rug made by amarchand who is one of the inmates and he named his rug as old as gold and he said that you know he truly feels that when you are in the moment of happiness and when you are in the moment of sadness that cycle come and goes but what really stays with you is the peace and that you can enjoy you know at any at any moment of the day and that is where he sort of woven like a carnival all across all across uh, you know the design and the red patch that you are seeing here in the rug this is actually when the last time he came to the jail he saw uh, he saw his uh, mother's dupatta or uh, you know or a textile or let's say uh, you know the uh, one of his mother's textile which is in red color and she used to uh, you know she used to clean his sweat from that color uh, textile and that's why the last panel in the rug that he has woven is with that particular red color and amar chand's rug recently got the triple id uh, you know commendation as well and just about one of uh, many rugs from the freedom manjaha so this has been uh, called the tikona rug uh, by gansham and actually just to tell you that you know sometimes they weave their name into the rugs as well which which become the unique part uh, to the of the artist so they actually wove their name at the end of the panel and at the same time they name their rugs by themselves and he says that you know when he entered into the prison because of uh, you know one or the other reason he felt very shattered but since the time they sort of you know started working on to the manchahas their energy is being channelized from from one direction to the another and however the rugs are being woven in the jail you'll get to see all the beautiful things coming out of the rug maybe sometimes it's a mobile tower or sometimes it's a bird or sometimes it's a home or the boundaries and very many things which comes and goes around their thoughts you know in a particular day and just to talk about what we have been able to create with this uh, sort of initiative where we do not just only you know treat rugs as a as a flooring but it is much more than that they they speak the stories and with each manchaha as it is unique to the artist as it is unique and one of a kind we are actually see it uh, you know uh, it as a opportunity of these modern rugs to be showcased uh, you know in the museums and become a collectibles at a point of time 
and then just talking about the impact figure so far we have trained around 80 plus inmates and uh, 40 being released because of their discipline so when i say release they have been actually shifted from a normal jail to the open jail where they have some certain kind of more freedom and then uh, they have been able to generate income for their families and uh, the, we you know we every time we go to the prisons here that this is actually impacted them very very positively and very quickly, I want to tell you that, you know, uh, Kavita, who is our design director and also Yogesh's sister, has uh, conceptualized this Manchaha initiative. And this initiative has won so far 11 prestigious global awards, you know, all while going up against the mega design houses. And uh, just to end this with a quote uh, with our founder, as it's a family run business, and our founder started it back in 1978. And right now, Jaipur Rugs is leading. Uh, so many such innovations and initiatives, which is sort of changing the face of the carpet industry at the same time. I rest my presentation here and then I uh, ask Ben to please take it forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was uh, extremely, extremely edifying and interesting. Um, I am, um, we've had a slight change of plan because of um, the uh, uh, change of, of Yogesh not being here. So um, I am going to basically take you through um, some slides and hopefully show you some uh, of the history and context of uh, what Jaipur rugs are doing and the history of carpet weaving in, um, in India. And I think that that uh, just to say a little bit about Harley Publications. So we produce uh, Harley, which has been going since um, we're on our 209th edition of the magazine um, and charts the world of antique carpets and textiles. And we also produce Cover Magazine, um, which is about contemporary carpets. And we also produce books, as you can see, um, a recently produced book on Indian textiles um, for a client in um, in Switzerland. And just a little heads up to you all, we just released a book called Thousand Years of Indian Textile Design, which is um, a prolific collector in London called Karun Thakkar, who's um, collection is going to be shown at the Washington Textile Museum um, later uh, in January, in fact. So marrying the old and the new um, in, in our magazines and our knowledge allows us to have a, a unique perspective on, on carpets, I think. And, and I think um, it's important to be able to... Um, understand that new carpets and old carpets um, are, are very similar, they're, they're, they're linked, the technique has not changed very much. So in the history of oriental carpets, um, about two and a half thousand years, it's a very conservative tradition. This technique has not changed uh, very much. And I always find it remarkable that, that the oriental carpet still remains relevant to us today. I find it, and here we have, here we have two of the oldest carpets that, that we um, currently know. Um, the one, the, the shaped carpet on the left is um, not widely known actually. So it's a bit of a, bit of a unique spot for you all. Um, this is, in Iranian carpet. It's dated 7th to 4th century before the common era. So, um, and this is done by carbon 14 dating. Um, this is a much more sort of tribal weave, as you can see. And then we have a um, very famous carpet, the Pazric carpet, which um, many people will know. Sorry, someone's cutting grass next door. Um, uh, and this is a very, as you can, this was found in Siberia and is in the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. And this is dates, carbon dates to the fourth to the third century before the common era. And you can see that this is a very sophisticated uh, uh, 
carpet you can see that that this is part of a um of a long and sophisticated workshop tr tradition this is not the first carpet clearly um it's very well planned and very well executed but these carpets were made with exactly the same knotting technique as the carpets that we have just been being told about so this dil say carpet that um has been made by um, Sonia and her family is knotted in exactly the same way. Um, they, the, the people that wove the horse cover and then the people that wove the Jaipur carpet um, have used exactly the same technique. And I, find, I think it, it's remarkable that a conservative tradition has continued to remain relevant and integral to our lives. And I think that, that there is a, a, a link between these weavers. And I think that, that it's important to, to stress that heritage in India as well. Um, and I think that the carpets from the Mughal period here is a, a great example. So a little bit out of focus from, um, the, the Gulbenkian. Um, this is one of the most supreme expressions of the weaver's art that's ever been ever been uh, created, and we can see just how dynamic the design is, and how much um, layering there is, and how much detail there is, um, and how the vines overlay each other. Uh, and this is the. Uh, you know, a great tradition in um, in Indian carpets. And it's important to stress this tradition um, because, and the link with the past, because today India is the largest manufacturer of handmade carpets in the world. Um, it has about 40% of, of the whole global market. And India is without doubt the most important player in the international rug market. And stressing this sense of tradition um, is very important because for many people and for, for many, many years, when people talked about uh, a handmade carpet or an oriental carpet, people nearly always referred to um, a Persian carpet or perhaps to, um, to Turkish carpets, um, which is... Uh, uh, I think probably one of the endemic problems that the appreciation of Persian carpets has had, uh, of Indian carpets have had over the years, that people have always mistaken them for um, mistaken them for Persian carpets. Um, I think he here, um, I'll just go through the slides and, and, and talk through them rather than give a a formal lecture. So the um, traditional uh, uh, history of Indian carpet making um, is thought to uh, uh, thought that in, uh, carpets first came into India from Central Asia in around about the 16th century, either during the first time of the first Mughal emperor, Babur, or, who is a descendant of the Timurids, or um, through his son, Humayun, who spent 15 years in exile in Kabul under the protection of the Safavid Shah Tamas, when uh, he lost control over India. When you can see here, um, he, this is Humayun and Shah Tamas in a in a this miniature, and you can see that it's decorated with lots of um, Persian carpets, um, showing uh, uh, how important they were in Iran at the time. And when um, when he returned, when uh, Humayun returned um, to reclaim his his territories. He brought with him um, a lot of Persian artists, and we also think that he bought um, a lot of weavers as well. And they were, the weavers were sort of very easily and, and uh, uh, welcome 
to be drawn away from Iran at the time because Ta Shah Tamasra in about 1540 was turning away from the arts and creating a much more sort of austere um, environment at, at the court and people were not getting court patronage any, anymore. So this provided really sort of fertile territory um, for establishing workshops and a new tradition within um, it, under the Mughal court. And it also meant that Persian taste was very much in ascendancy at, at court. So this is the traditional narrative um, that, that we have about contemporary, about uh, the arrival of carpets in, in India. But uh, another um, narrative is, is suggested by the work of this um, researcher Stephen Cohen, who has found in um, various archives um, references to carpets being made in India. Um, there's some mention in an 8th century Chinese Tang um, uh, trade records. There are also an Arab historian mentions carpets being exported from Sindh in 985. Um, and in the 14th century, there are uh, references to fine carpets being made and exported from Delhi as well. But the these were all sort of fragments of, of history and, and fragments of carpets would appear, but there was no, nothing that sort of helped us draw a, a larger picture. That was until this carpet um, emerged in 1997. Um, it came from a Himalayan monastery um, and it's silk. It's the oldest silk carpet of any type that, that we know. Um, and it is dated very securely with a number of carbon tests to the first half of the 15th century. And it is thought to have been made in the Deccan area. Um, this is um, now in the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha. And as I go through, I'd like just to draw attention to some of the um, institutions and some of the, the names associated with these carpets um, so that you can understand the depth of appreciation and the history of connoisseurship um, of uh, the finest Mughal carpets throughout the last uh, uh, few hundred years. Um, this carpet has been given the name the Astapada carpet because of this um, eight by so eight by eight, eight by eight um, uh, gaming board that I th think you will all know better than me is associated with uh, an Indian Indian board game. Um, the the largest group of Indian classical carpets that we do know were woven under the reign of Akbar at the end of the 16th century, and here we have a wonderful um, miniature illustrating uh, uh, some carpets um, at court um, and Akbar on a raised dais here. Um, but for many years, everyone thought that because of the, the history that I just related, that all of these carpets were probably, um, were probably Persian. Um, and that they were imported from Iran rather than made in India. But we do know from the Akbar Nama um, that Akbar did establish court workshops for carpets, both in Lahore and Fatapur Sikri, and indeed Agra as well, where weavers probably from Persia and Central Asia worked alongside Indian craftsmen. And this allowed um, uh, a mixture of uh, techniques and motifs to, to emerge. Um, and actually in the uh, uh, Akbar Nama, there, there is a, a quote, a direct quote that, that is important for carpet people, as it says, um, his official chronicler says, I quote, um, he has 
Akbar has caused carpets to be made of wonderful varieties and charming textures. He has appointed experienced workmen who produced many masterpieces. The carpets of Iran and Turan are no more thought of, Turan being Central Asia. Now, this, this mixing of, of um, styles and uh, decorative palettes um, led, has led to unique, um, a unique uh, compositions in, in Indian carpets from this early period. And here is one such example. I mean, it's, it's wonderful and, and bizarre. On a Persian carpet, we would expect to see lots of flowering vines and scrolling flower patterns, etc. But here we have a sort of sprouting tree of, of menagerie of animals, including, as we can see, in a, lots and lots of uh, elephants. So, although this carpet has a particularly in Indian theme, um, a lot of carpets for many years were mistaken as being Persian, but we do know, and we, we now can identify the difference between, or some of the differences between um, Persian and Indian. Most importantly is the warp, which is used to um, go along the carpet, as opposed to the weft, which goes across. Um, the warps on Indian carpets always have over five strands, historically, in them. Um, as you can see here in the middle, it has 10 strands there, which is a particular. In Iranian carpets, it's always four strands make up the ply rather than, rather than uh, 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 over, over four. Also, technically, um, there are two, two things that we find in the decoration of the fields of carpets. One is the appearance of this racine, this, this long, um, uh, uh, what do we call this? This long floor, uh, bud with sort of, uh, uh, um, which we don't find on any other, on carpets in, in Iran at all. And also this use of what we call tones, your tone coloring. This is two, colors that are close uh, close in depth of color, but there's no separation, there's no outlining between them. So it's, it's two uh, complementary colors used to shade. Um, these we will see in a few carpets as, as we uh, as, as we move on. So um, carpets were were, were made in um, in workshops um, and they uh, were made on these uprights, upright looms as you can see here and interestingly in this picture um, you can see that um, there is someone in the corner who's not weaving and and that is the um, the person who is calling out or chanting the um, the design rather than it being painted on, so to speak, painted onto a cartoon, it was spoken and the rhythm of the, um, that, that was sung was the pattern and the rhythm was reflected in the pattern being built up or, on the loom. And so the, the carpets of the, this period were, had particular Indian qualities as we can see here in this carpet with these very realistic depiction of elephants fighting with the mahouts on top. And this is uh, the detail that's done that's, that we see in the elephants is rather at odds with the scale of the rest of the carpet because the elephants are the same, are the same size as the crane or the heron and the same size as all of the flowers. So this is a sort of, the emergence of um, workshops and they haven't quite got the the full scale or um, all of the compositional tools working at, at full strength at, at this time. So the carpets uh, during this period also had 
had a, a, a strong affiliation to the carpet, to um, the, the miniature painters. And I think you can see here um, this effect. There's only a few of these. Most of the carpets of the period have a symmetry, both uh, vertically and horizontally. So you just need a quarter of the pattern to be able to make a whole carpet. This is clearly taken from a miniature. And we see all, all, all types of life here. We have two princes at the top in a, in a kiosk being fanned by someone. We have, um, we have a cheetah being transported on a, on a carriage um, by an oxen with a, interestingly, with a stripy keelin underneath it. We have someone walking, uh, carrying an antelope over his, uh, over his shoulders as well. And then we see in the borders, um, I think you can hope you can all see, we can see these, these sort of fantastic masks, these grotesques, these faces of people and animals that are uh, put into all of the flowers. This is a, a very um, particular um, style that we find on, on Indian carpets. And interestingly, some of these motifs we can find on other carpets as well, which suggests that there was a close affiliation between the design, uh, the miniature painters and the, the weaving workshops. Um, and then carpets, um, they continue to be an important part of the expression of power um, in court under the reign of Jahangir, who ruled from 1650 to 1627. And as you can see here that the carpet um, is very realistically depicted. You can see the, the fringes um, very clearly depicted. And the pattern is a, is a knowable pattern from other carpets as well. So it's very clearly depicted, but there's a very purposeful use of um, the carpet under, under the emperor's feet. It's, it's as if the carpet sort of designates a sacred space. And I think that that's a an important point to hold in mind as as we move as we move through this. Um, so at this time, the East India Company was um, beginning to have a foothold in 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 India, and it was shipping by 1650. There are records of Lahore carpets being shipped from Surat to London, where they met uh, a very eager and and. Uh, uh, appreciative um, audience. And the Dutch East India Company was um, at the time already well established in India and they were exporting carpets to India and we can trace patterns in paintings from the Dutch Golden Age as well, which helps us with the dating chronology of carpets. But at the time, the carpets that were being imported into Europe. They weren't being used for the floor, they were being used to cover tables. And Queen Elizabeth I's palace at Greenwich, for example, the floor was covered in, ru in rushes. It, all, it didn't have, have carpeting. So these fine carpets that were imported were all being used um, on tables. Um, and we have one such carpet that is still um, in the place where it was ordered for, and it's still there. It was ordered by um, Robert Bell, who was the head of the East uh, India Corporation, and he ordered it, or East India Company, sorry, he ordered it from Lahore in 1630, and it was delivered in 1634 to the Girdlers Company in the city of London. And it still is there. It's moved from being on the table and now has pride of place in the main hall hanging on the wall. And it's still in amazing condition, but you can see here, it's a very Persianate design, but you can see the, the stains and, and from when it was on the table, we have an Indian carpet stained with Indian ink. Um, and there are other places where, interestingly, they got the 
coat of arms wrong. It's the wrong way around. Somehow it got transposed in, in, in the weaving or in the telling somehow. Normally they might send it back nowadays. Um, but it's not just um, in Europe that carpets were being, Indian carpets were being appreciated. There's also a very big, important group that we can find in Japan. And this carpet, for example, this beautiful carpet, um, was um, dates to about 1630, perhaps. And we know that it was acquired in 1650 by um, the Gion Matsuri Association in Kyoto. And every year, this carpet has is put in pride of place on one of the uh, floats that are um, proceed through through the uh, through the city of, of Kyoto and this is the first float and the Indian carpet is the most prominent um, textile that's historic textile that's shown. The carpets from this period are just uh, exceptionally beautiful and get more and more refined and there are several sort of techniques that we use to to get this refinement this is called the lady ilchester carpet and um it's what uh, the weavers would do is is that they would take um threads of wool that were slightly close in color they're not exactly the same and they would ply them together and weave them into areas of, of a flat color as we see where these animals are here. And by having um, slight variations in the color, it creates a, a sense of depth that our eye can read. It can't read a flat color, but variations we do read, and that's how we understand depth of color and how you get this shading and a sense of realism and uh, uh, the sort of voluptuousness of, the, of these animals. And here we also can see in the detail of this carpet, this ton ton colouring, which is unique to, to Indian carpets, where um, here it's a claret and then a, a slight sort of pinkier shade is used to create the layering of this floral bud. Or here we have a lighter green uh, used to outline vine, uh, the lowest level of vines on a on the background here. And here is the uh, racine uh, floral bud that I was talking about uh, uh, earlier. Um, so there was a there was a desire there was a desire at this point to make even finer carpets um, to, to go one, one level uh, uh, finer, uh, ever more refined. And what at the moment we were looking at wool on a cotton foundation and the weavers understood that what they could do is they could use silk as a foundation to make the rug finer. And then they used pashmina wool a unique product to India, and it can be spun extremely finely, and it takes colour absolutely beautifully. And what this allowed was an, probably the most sumptuous and exquisite group of carpets, the pashmina pile carpets that were made in, in India. So here is an example of one pashmina pile carpet that's in, that's in the Met. And I think it, you can see how the detailing and the, the texture that is created um, moves the composition onto a, another level. So you have a real depth of field in, that's just the border, the, the depth of field in this carpet, but also it allows greater refinement in terms of the vines um, going over each other and creating a sense of, of depth. You also get a lot more shading in the edges of the um, the edges of these florets as well, and it helps create a sense of uh, both 
um, the weight of the blooms, they seem as though they're so fecund and, 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 and verdant, but it also gives a sense of movement as well, which we hadn't seen up until then. And I would say that for us, the small, these details are easy to tell in these fragments of carpet. When we have a whole carpet, it's very difficult to see the brilliance of the in, individual motifs. And it's in, it's in the detail that, that the, the carpet reveals its brilliance. Whereas in, in the whole thing, it's just dif too difficult to uh, comprehend. And then there, there's a group of um, these uh, uh, arch, they, they're referred to as prayer rugs. I, I don't think they are. I think it's just an architectural motif that's being used. Um, and these are, the finest, the absolute finest of, of the Indian, in, of the Mughal period rugs, but also simply the finest rugs that probably have, have ever been made. I think this, this rug is, for example, it's difficult to work to understand, but with 1,956 knots per square inch, so if an inch is on your thumb, it, it's quite quite mind-boggling. For a long time, these were mistaken as as being um, velvets because no one could actually see the knots, and so people hadn't appreciated them as ha hand-woven carpets. Ironically, um, they don't need to be this fine because you can see that there's a lot of area that's not decorated, which um, is peculiar because it doesn't need to be. A plain colour doesn't need to be that finely knotted. So I think that this is a, a demonstration of, of um, uh, the extraordinary luxury and patronage of um, the court. It's effectively saying we make it this fine because we can. Um, these carpets, unfortunately, they're so fine, they're made on silk, they're so fine that, that they they just don't last. The silk rots and they crack, and these carpets, um, the carpets um, fall apart. Unfortunately, you can see this one's beginning to. This is in a private collection in in Belgium. So little bits of these carpet do come up every now and again, and this is a. These are beautiful. These blossoms. This is a, a an example that came up not so long uh, a few years ago um, at Christie's. And it's a tiny little bit. It's uh, 16 centimet centimetres by 48 centimetres. And that came up and it was um, a lot of competition for it. It was estimated at £25,000 and it, it sold for £87,000 or $112,000. And I hope that that demonstrates how um, sought after these carpets still are how much they are appreciated and how they are the absolute epitome of the weaver's art. So um, these carpets uh, uh, moved on, um, moved on in, in, in later in the, in the in mid 17th century, um, we start seeing these single flower. Uh, uh, the single flower is part, uh, part of the um, composition, more so than overall vines. Um, and this was um, mostly found in Jahangir and then sh his son Shah Jahan's uh, uh, pit reigns. The, the emphasis focused much more on these single flowers um, and they inherited um, an interest from European uh, herbaries and these are uh, botanical drawings of flowers in multiple um, uh, uh, seen in, in, in all of its different different views and these single flowers became part of um, uh, 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 all architectural decoration we can see this in this um, this wonderful miniature here, um, and you can see that not only are they part of the architectural decoration, but we find them on the carpets as well. 
And interestingly here, we can see the carpet is an integral part of the, of the composition, but it's also uh, creates the sort of central place of power and, and privilege within, within the painting as well. It designates a royal space. And these also, this carpet also reflects this singular um, flowering style. And there is a, a group from this, this, uh, this period um, that were found in Amer Palace uh, and belong to the uh, Rajas of Amer. There's 27 carpets that, that were found uh, in the storerooms there. And uh, 27 of them, they're shaped in this way so that these carpets would, could become an integral part of a space. So there would be a raised dais, which a throne would be on, and there are some round or, or, or octagonal carpets that would have occupied that throne area. And the rest of the floor and space around the dais um, would be covered with these singular carpets that are orientated um, to the view of the person sitting in the middle as well, which is another sense of that, that designating um, carpets, designating and radiating power and privilege. This, there's 27 of them, they're now in different here. I think I've, I think I've probably gone on a little bit long, so I will um, finish. These are an interesting group of carpets because they were recorded, and they're recorded in these um, black and white photographs in 1929 when um, they, Mr. Campbell uh, took photographs of them and he discovered that they still had their original labels on the back, some of them. In fact, this carpet here um, had a label on the back which recorded when it was bought um, and it says on the back of the carpet, bought from Gokal Das, trader, shopkeeper of Lahore, 29th of June, 1659. So not only are they great carpets, but they also are, are um, important in us creating uh, a secure chronology for these carpets. I'll just rush through these last few, few slides. Um, later on in the 18th century, this develops into this mille fleur style, which you might be familiar with which um, we find on shawls as well. And the flowers become part of a much more sort of complex uh, architectural scheme. And um, notice this was once with the Vanderbilts in, in New York. Um, and then later on, this gives way to this Meal Fleur uh, prayer rug group, which um, I say prayer rug, I don't think it is a prayer rug. Um, this Milfler style, um, ironically, went back, it went into Iran and became the basis for a lot of um, 19th century Iranian carpet design. So we may have started off with people thinking that Persian car Indian carpets were Persian carpets, but in a way, Indian carpets had the last laugh because their design vocabulary was then used in Iran to create the decorative schemes that, that's now seen very Persian. And then later on in the 19th century, so when um, Nader Shah invaded um, uh, India, it was the sort of end of the Mughal period and there was a, a quiet period, period in carpet production. And then in the mid 19th century, when sort of industrialization and uh, uh, colonial administration had led to huge amounts of money being made in Europe. Um, the great and the good, the industrialists, all were building new houses and the demand for carpets became hugely, uh, it was absolutely huge, it, it grew exponentially. And India supplied a lot of the carpets um, from uh, uh, to the royal, ha royal households, to the lords and ladies, to palaces throughout Europe. Um, carpets such as this, which um, which was made in Agra jail.
the biggest carpet of this type um, is in fact here um, in the Houses of Part in, in Windsor Castle, where the Queen um, awards knighthoods to members of the public. It's probably the largest carpet that was ordered. It's it's 12 metres by 24 metres or, or 39 by 78 foot, however you um, uh, take your measurements. And it uh, was, was so big when it was um, delivered that they needed 40 men to carry it and they needed to winch it in with all of the royal household on scaffolding and ropes to be able to winch it in into place so big it, uh, it was so big and i'm just going to finish because i think i've over talked i want to finish with just my favorite indian carpet which is this wonderful um, carpet that's in the Frick collection in, in New York. Um, it's a pashmina pile. It's made up actually of 14 pieces. And uh, the scheme on the right hand side is what the carpet would have looked like originally. Um, and I think the fact that it has survived that all of these fragments were seen to be so important and valuable that they were, were kept and reassembled so that they could be, um, so that could be kept together, um, I think says a lot about the importance and beauty of Indian carpets from the Mughal period, but also probably helps illustrate one of the unknown sort of success stories of, of India, which is the appreciation by the great and the good of the part it, in the West of Mughal carpets. And that's me done.